again good morning um, today we are going to <coughs> we're going to speak about well not necessarily database access but more about asynchronous programming in JavaScript so continue speaking about asynchronous programming in JavaScript uh, and we are going to see also that uh, that thing that I mentioned to you last time that is the, the callback the callback hell uh, and ways to avoid it and we will use database as a way to experiment with asynchronous hmm? since we are creating a web application in the end we will need at a certain point a database so we we are introducing it now in Node.js as a way to store data and to interact with some data so that you can not only add and delete things from a list in your code, but you can also add and delete and edit things on something that is more persistent uh, than a list uh, or an object embedded in your code. Mm -hmm. So in the first hour, we are going to speak about asynchronous programming and promises, and in the second hour and the half after the break, we are going to do an exercise on, on all these. So let's start from database. What, what is a database? You, you know what is a database, and so I'm not going to, to repeat it. Um, and uh, on the web, clearly, a web server typically stores its own data on a database for persistence, and Node.js, either used for a web server or used for uh, a desktop, let's say, program, supports most databases, uh, most of the databases that you can uh, have in mind. Mm -hmm. So here there is a list of databases that are supported uh, by Node.js. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a quite wide choice, uh, for instance. And this is not clearly an exhaustive list, it's just some of the databases that Node.js support. So we have no problem in supporting whatever database we want on Node.js. Uh, what we are going to use in this course, since we are most foc focusing on the front end of web application uh, and we need something to, let's say, prototype and easy to, to deliver and to submit uh, between you and, uh, and me uh, as a teacher, um, we are going to use SQLite. Mm? SQLite is a very simple and small volume uh, and adapt for small volume application uh, database that is contained on a single file. Mm? So the database is just a file on your project. So this is clearly easy and simple for us because if we need to give you a database, I just need to give you a file. Mm? And vice versa, if you, need, if you need to give me a database, it's just a file. There is no configuration, no software to install uh, generally, etc. This is clearly simple, very well suited for this course. Clearly, if you're going to do a web application to deploy in, in the world, this is not the, the best solution. You, you should leverage on database like MySQL, Postgre, etc. Mm? But for our purposes, for prototyping purposes, for small data also, it, it's, more than, it's more than good uh, and more than fine. Mm? So we're going to use SQLite also here in this example so that it's also easier uh, for you to get this database and all the content. And in Node.js, we are going to use the SQLite module. Mm -hmm. So like we installed DJS last time, we're going to install also SQLite this time. Mm -hmm. Same process, once you have a, pro a project in, with NPM, you just type NPM install SQLite or NPM A uh, SQLite and it will be installed. Mm -hmm. And clearly it has a documentation, a website, uh, all what you can imagine. And SQLite is a SQL database. Mm? So uh, the, the standard way of writing um, queries uh, are supported. Mm? And how you are going to use it uh, in the code, for here there is an example. We are going to, to do it and to see it, but here is a quick example. Uh, you import the database, import the library, like you imported the JS. Uh, both here are in the lab, then you open, mm, you create and open 
the database and here you put the file name of the database on disk mm? so if it's in the same folder it's just the name with the extension otherwise just the full path of the of the database and this will uh, generate this will uh, require um, a callback mm, and that handle both the error and the success of the uh, usage of the database and in the end after doing all the operation that you want to do on a database getting information writing information editing information etc uh, you have to clearly close the database mm? so you open the database do the queries close the database and you are going to write queries in, in SQL, mm? uh, so like, like string. So how we can do queries in uh, SQLite? SQLite has four methods to do queries. Mm? And some of these methods has, are general, others are more suitable for specific operation that you want to do. Mm? Uh, so given as a prerequisite that you have somewhere uh, SQL query select something or something like this db.all gives you executed query and gives you all the rows in the result so db.all is useful for is typically used for all the queries like select asterisk from select everything from Mm, where you have more than one line of result from the query. Mm. And uh, the syntax, the signature is, is, is this one. You have db, db is the object you created, dot all, and then there is the query, there are any parameters that are needed to the query, and then there is a callback that has, as a per first parameter, the object containing the error, mm, impossible to access the database, the table is not existing, etc and the rows as the result. Mm? And here you write what you want to do with the result. Mm? You get the row and you want to maybe print on screen or save it in a, in a list or manipulate it to do something. Mm? So here in the body of the callback, you tell the software what you want to do after getting the results of the query or handling the error mm? as well. And here, if error is true, there are some errors. Otherwise, rows contain the results. And rows, since this is the b.all, and expect more than one row as a result, rows is an array, mm? always an array. And then you can write something like this, mm? for each rows, not for each, to iterate on the array that is rows. Mm? Nothing particularly strange in theory right okay then there are another methods that is similar to all uh, and it's quite used as well that is the b.get mm? the b.get will give you the first row of the results mm? so if you have more than one row to get from a database the b.all if you just have a query that you know will give you at maximum one result then you can use the b.get and write the query here in the first parameter in the first argument like select something from table where id equal one mm? so that you are sure that you have just at maximum one element back of the database mm? uh, then there is another method um, and these give you a row Notice that in the other methods it was called the rows because it was an array. This is just a single row. Mm. Um, Db.each is less used actually, but execute uh, the callback mm, once per each results row. So you do the query and for each row in the results you execute something here. Mm. So the difference here is that you get the results in here in the callback, you manipulated the result. In this case, one result only. In the case of the be all, you get all the results. Here, it executes the query, and for each 
results, it executes this. Mm. This is less, less use actually in, in practice. Mm. Uh, and then there is the BRAM, mm. because all and get will give you is for basically select. Mm. But if you want to create something, you want to update something, you want to insert something, you want to delete something, you don't get information from the database. You actually do action from the database to the database. And uh, you can use the b.run. Hmm? So all, get all the information, get, get a single row, maximum, run, execute the other queries. These are the three uh, methods that we are going to use a lot. Hmm? And you see the signature is always the same. The first parameter is the query. The second parameter is an array containing parameters to the query. And then there is a function hmm, uh, that in this case only have the, the error because you uh, don't have hmm, results coming from the database. So you are just uh, saying there what you want to do after executing the, the query. Hmm. Uh, and this is clearly for statement that not, does not return a value like insert, update, again, delete. And you have two things available here in this callback. Uh, two, par two parameters, two variables. One is called these.changes, and one is called these.lastID. And you can use those for understanding whether mm, your operation uh, went well or not. Uh, these.changes is a number uh, representing uh, the number of affected rows of the operation. Mm. So if you update something, if you update 10 rows in a database, that variable will contain, if everything works well, 10. The number of rows in the database that were changed. Mm. And last ID ins instead will contain the number of the last inserted rows ID. So clearly, for insert query, it's useful. So if it's return you five and you have four element in the database, the D is five, and then you, you know that the insertion went well, and you know which is the D of the new line, the new row that, is, that has been inserted in the database. And these are variables that are available here. So here, you don't have to define them, is the library that make it available for you this.change and this.lastd. Uh, hmm? So if you want to use it, you can return this.lastd or console.log this.lastd. If you don't, just you don't need to use it. You need to write them. So it's up to you. If you want this information back or printing or something else, you can use it. Are variables available only in the b.run? So you don't have those in uh, the b.all and the b.get, clearly. This is for running thing. So you, you don't have changes in a select. You don't have a last ID in a select. You have some rows directly in a select. Hmm? Uh, and notice one thing here. Uh, notice the signature of this. Hmm? So this is a callback. And we can define callbacks as we want clearly, and here it was defined as a narrow function. Mm, that you know, it's one of the three main kind of function that we can define. If we skip function expression named and not named, and we say just function expression, there are just three. Mm? And so here you can use whatever you want. You can, also, you can use function expression, you can use uh, arrow function, uh, etc. cetera. An arrow function is typically shorter to write. Uh, notice what we wrote here. Here, we don't put a narrow function. So here, uh, why we don't put uh, a narrow function? Because to have this for how the arrow function work and for how they work with the this keyword, hmm, the one for changing elasticity, if you put here a narrow function, these two variables are useless you don't get any information from those two variables. Mm. You can use it, but they are with undefined or null, some values like this. Mm. So they are not reliable because arrow function redefined this. 
This is a preview. We are going to see that. Further, but Aaron function has its own D's. Mm? Instead, this is the D's of the db dot run. Mm? So here, if you want to use these two variables, you cannot use an arrow function. You can use a function expression. If you don't need to use any of those two, you can do whatever you want. You can also use an arrow function. But if you need either changes or last D, don't use an arrow function because they are not reliable with an arrow function. Okay? In the other one, instead, you can use whatever you want because they don't have this, this dot something, the db dot get, the db dot all. And then we have uh, parametric queries. Mm? So we, we said that here you have a parameter, an array of parameters that are the parameters that you uh, want to use in the query. Mm? Like select everything from students where student ID equal, and you want to pass that value, the ID of the student as a parameter. Mm? And so you don't write here as a string concatenation, never, very, very bad. But you pass the ID of the students, in this example, as a parameter. Mm? How in this way? Mm? So here there is uh, an example. Select everything from course where the course code is the course code of this course. Mm? So what you, you have to do is to write the query as a string and then when you have a parameter, put a question mark. Mm? And then when you use the b.get, run, all, etc., you put in this array the parameter that you need to get from the code. Mm? So writing like this will generate, will execute a query that is select uh, everything from a course where code equal the content on this variable the content of code, mm? that, let's say, the code of this course. Mm? And then everything is, is as, as normal. Mm? Uh, and if you have more than one parameter, mm? you have to list them in this array in the same order as they appear in the string. Mm? So if you have two question marks where code equals something and something else, the first parameter will be the code, the variable hosting the code, and the second parameter will be the variable hosting the other things that you want to put after the end, mm? where code equal whatever, and students, number of students greater than question mark. Mm? So here you will have code in this array, code, comma, uh, student number, current student number, mm? maximum student number, whatever it is, that variable. So in order, more than one parameter in order in the same array. And again, if you have a query with a parameter, always do that. Let me repeat it just one more time. Always do that. Never, ever in the world doing string concatenation, like select uh, everything from course where code equal plus code, nor string interpolation so with the template string with a backtick and the dollar sign. Never. Mm. It's, it's a SQL injection. Can open to SQL injection that. Mm. So these are safer way all the database system have, all the libraries have this kind of mechanism for passing parameter. Mm. So this is a safer way to pass a parameter because it's the library that handles putting together the content of the variable with the string. Okay? Good. So let's see an example. Mm. Uh, I put, uh, we, we have this um, database. Mm. Uh, it's a SQLite database. Uh, you have this in the folder week three uh, on the GitHub repository. There is a folder called examples inside week three uh, with all the examples reported in this set of slides. Mm. So it's basically copy and paste from the slides and put it in a, in a file uh, with the database, with this database. Mm. So if you want, you, you also have that, those, but it's, it's basically the things that were written in the slides. 
nothing more and less, just in JavaScript style. So let's, let's have this database. You have a database in which you have two tables. One is called course, mm, which has the, uh, the code of some courses, the name of some courses, and the credits of some courses. And then you have another table that's called score, mm, in which you have the course code, the score that you get at the exam, uh, if you get the, the low there or not, mm, uh, zero for uh, false and one for true, and the date in which you pass the exam. So you have the, your courses and your exams. And they are matched by the course code, essentially. Mm. So this 25 is the 25 for computer architecture. And this hypothetical student has these courses in their career and just passed one exam, that is computer architecture. Hmm? So uh, I can also open it. Um, there should be this one. Hmm? Okay, this is, you see, this is just a file with extension SQLite. Actually, you can use also DB as an extension, SQLite doesn't really care too much. DB is fine, SQLite is fine. Um, and, and you can open it, uh, there is this, for instance, this program that's called DB, DB browser for SQLite. There should be the link on the website uh, among developer tools, um, in the section developer tools. Uh, and it's just a standalone application that you, for old operating system, and you can just open it, and it allows you to open and edit and create SQLite database. Um, and so here, for instance, you see we have something very, very close to, um, to the one reported in the slides. You have a course database, a course table with just uh, four courses in this case, uh, with the credits, and you have mm, another table with the score for the same 25 for the same computer architecture program. Mm. So here you have the database, you also can see the structure of the database if you want so for creating the database. So you just have the structure here, you can add tables, you can modify tables, you can modify fields, etc. You can do everything you can, mostly everything you can imagine with a simple database. Mm. Um, so here you create a structure, here you browse the data, and you can also execute query directly from here to see the results if you want. So just a very simple program to, to do that. And you see also how these tables were created. Mm? They were created like dear here where code is text uh, and the primary key is code. And here uh, they don't have a primary key mm? as they were created. Mm? So this is just our database. And here uh, I have, do you see? in the back of the room. No, it's a mixed opinion. Now? Um, uh, here we have uh, the program, this is, is actually in the slides, so it's, it's the same that you have in the slides, is uh, a small program uh, that's called transcript that uh, imports the database here Import the database here, open the database. You see, open just by name. That's what's called the transcript.sqlite is in the same folder because it's here. So uh, just the name of the file. Uh, if there is an error, let's throw an exception with the error. Um, in the opening, maybe the file is not available. Maybe you misspelled the name. Maybe there is a folder you don't, didn't write the folder, uh, whatever. And then we have this simple query. Uh, let's ignore the commented part for now. You have this simple query. Select everything from courses, and then there is a left join on score to match the course code and uh, the exam score. Mm. Uh, and then select everything from courses, and when there is an exam, just put the, the, the score of the exam together with the <coughs> course. Mm. So here we have two tables, but it's not really important. Uh, for this purpose that we have two tables, one table, or one million tables, it's the same. Uh, so we, have, we want to get all the courses 
with their score if they are available. Mm. And so what we are going to do, the be all, because we want to get all the courses, uh, or more than one at least, with the query, SQL, we don't have parameters, mm, so we can omit the, the array for parameters, and then the callback. Mm. And in the callback we say, if there is an error, show me the error, uh, otherwise, for each row in the rows array, mm, so we get all the exam, all the courses, and for each of them, just let's do console.log. Let's print at screen, on screen, the exam. Mm? Uh, and then, here it's missing the b.close, by the way. Mm? So imagine line 23, the b.close. OK, so if we try to run this, uh, so actually, In the, in the packages.json, mm, there is already the SQLite tree library installed, so I don't need to install explicitly mm, to add it here. But you see here, we don't have the node modules folder. Mm. So it means that uh, we never run this. So we need to actually, so the SQLite, SQLite tree as a library is available in the package the JSON, but it's not installed on my computer now. Mm? So we need to do NPM install. Mm? Uh, maybe in the right folder. Mm? So NPM install, just install everything that is as a dependency in package of the JSON, as a reminder, and this is everything is just SQLite tree. Okay, so now we can say node transcript .js. And so here we see that it worked. We see that we have information system security without score because we just have uh, computer architecture as a score. Computer architecture with, with that 25 uh, software engineering without anything, and web application one without anything. There were four courses, and we have here four courses. Hmm? Pretty easy, right? Any doubt of this? No. Okay, so now let's try to do the things that is commented hmm, in the comments. So what is in the comments? In the comments you see that there is Basically, what we want to say is say, okay, well, we are going to create an array of results because we, we don't want really to just print on screen the results, right? We, we typically want to store them somewhere and then manipulate in the rest of our program. It's something reasonable to do. Mm -hmm. So we want to have um, an array here called uh, results that store the results of our query and then we can do something else. Uh, in the future with that. So we comment out console.log and we say results.push, push row. Mm? So we add results, our rows, one at a time in the results array. And then after iterating on all the rows, mm, we are going to do the same thing that we did before, but on the actual in the results. So we are going to print them out. But instead of printing, we could have done anything else, like manipulating, extracting something, showing on a web page. But we, we, we have separated here uh, the query. So we get the results from the query. And then after, we manipulate the results. Mm, that seems reasonable, right? OK. So what do we expect if we run this? If we run this, what do we expect to see on here in the console? Sure. 
an empty array, other options. Do you agree on the empty array? Or you don't have an opinion? So if we read this code, hmm, we see that it should print on screen the result, right? Yes. So do, do we expect that this will print out the results or not? We'll say yes. Who say no? Who say maybe? <laughs> okay. We are going to see. But clearly, the maybe are wrong. Uh, so either is yes or no. It prints just this line here. So the no win. No, no, we define results. It's here. It's syntactically correct. It should. more or less but yes that's the, the the reason so why we don't see anything so the people to say no why you were right that is 90 percent of the answer because the rows has not been filled yet so what happens here Here happens that this is an asynchronous call back. So what happens here is that JavaScript creates the array, creates the SQL variable with the string, call the b.all, call console.log, do this for on an empty array. And then at a certain, certain point in time, we'll execute this callback here. Because what your colleague was saying, we don't know in this moment whether this callback is done or not. And for how JavaScript work, typically not. It's not run yet. Because this is asynchronous. So we, we are going to see better this uh, when we speak about the event loop in the browser since it's, it's already a, an execution environment. But how JavaScript works is that JavaScript before executes all the synchronous code. And then, when it has nothing to do, executes the synchronous query, the asynchronous part. Hmm? So here, JavaScript is going to say, okay, DB all, get this query, execute this query, and then when you have time, get me back with the results and put the results in this array called the result. But when you have time, not now. So this is not blocking. We, are, we don't need to wait for the database to do all the operation. These are put aside and the rest of the program is executed. So here we see this clearly and here we don't see anything because the results has length of zero. So we don't even enter that for loop. Hmm? Is it clear? Can I explain again. So uh, this callback is asynchronous. Hmm? That means that it will be executed at a certain point in the future by JavaScript. So given that this is asynchronous, what happens in the program is that JavaScript, when it, you run the program, JavaScript will read the strict, will import here, will open the database, uh, will create the array, will create the string, 
we'll call the b dot all so we'll complete the query and we'll tell the database execute the query and then put this uh, this callback with the body of this callback in a side okay right now we I, I'm going to do it after so ignore this in the and at the moment and go here so print console log came here results in this point is empty because this was put aside so nobody put anything in the results and then this doesn't even e execute it because its results is empty so this loop for this for loop is just uh, let uh, anything of zero, something that is length of zero, so they don't even enter once. And at this point, this callback is executed. So after this line, we have this for loop here on the rows and the row inserted in the array. So here we print nothing because this result is not yet filled. filled. And uh, this is why, this is because this is, all of this is asynchronous. And again, asynchronous means doing it in a s point in the future that we don't know, but typically after all the synchronous code. Okay? Yes, no, more or less. So how can we fix it? If we really want to keep results as an array, to do something, something, let's imagine that the console.log is something more complex. How we can fix it to avoid this problem? Where do we need to put this? inside the callback. So if we want to have this running, we need to do this. So given that the callback is executed after, well, we don't have anything after the callback, but everything inside the callback, so it works, it should work, so we can try. And you see that we see all the courses, like before, etc. Okay. Uh, let me ask again if it's clear, because this is critical. Because you, you don't see here, uh, it's not written anywhere that there is uh, an asynchronous callback. There is not keyword, something strange written there that tell you that this is a synchronous callback. So it's something that you have to know because it's the signature of the db.all, db.get, and db.run, all of those are uh, synchronous, uh, asynchronous. And we have a lot of callbacks that are synchronous in JavaScript. So this is often the, the normal behavior. So right now, in the classical JavaScript, when you want to execute something after an uh, synchronous call, a synchronous callback, you have to put it inside the callback. Hmm? And here we can see uh, another example. You see here, so we have a database that's called data.sqlite is numbers. Numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, numbers. Increasing numbers. Uh, there are already 10 numbers. One to 11, one to, no, 10, one to 10. Um, in the database, there are some numbers in the database. Um, and here we have a for loop that say 100 time, insert, uh, 
the number one in the database and then do a select count ast astery, uh, everything from the number table and console that log mm, the result. So the insert one hundred time will and will add one to the table. Mm, so one, 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 one hundred time. And then the next query will count how many ones you have. Mm. So now we have let's say ten rows with one, and so that number will be 10. When we add another one, we expect 11, 12, etc. Hmm? If we run this, as before, remember that both run and all are asynchronous in the callback, hmm? in the execution. So if we run this, what we expect to see here in the console? 1 to 100, as we should expect, because we insert one and we say how many one we have one. We insert another one and how many one we have two, etc. So we, we expect to see one up to 11, uh, 100. In this moment, there are already 10 of them in, this li in the, the database. So 10 to uh, 110 or something in order or something different. Yes, um, more or less. Um, other answer? Other opinions? Do you agree or or not? Then we we run it. No other opinion. That's not good. Uh, Nod um, queries. So we started from 10, because we already had 10 them, 10 ones. And what we wrote in the code is uh, insert one tell me how many ones we have. So if we, what we should have expected is to have 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, up to 110. Instead, what we have is 11, 12, 15, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 17, 18, etc. Is it clear why? Someone say yes, someone say more or less. Someone say no, or just more or less. This happens because both insert and, so this is a, a tricky situation, not very common. Hmm? We want to insert something and then count something after the insertion. But both run, uh, sorry, both the insert and the select are asynchronous. So here, what we are saying is, please, when you have time, insert a number, one, in the database. And, and let me know what you have done. Uh, here, actually, there is no callback for getting the results. This dot last D is not written, but you have the callback here anyway. Hmm? So let me know when you have done. Uh, and then you have a select here. Hmm? 
that try to count it. So what it happens here is that we cannot, mm, and we have all synchronous, including the four. The four is synchronous. So this is happening exactly 100 times. And so exactly 100 times, we will have a request of inserting something and a request of counting something after, let's say, the inserting. So this code is actually executed 100 times before the database is closed. Because the four is synchronous. Hmm? So it behaves in a synchronous way. Execute those lines in order. Run all, run all for 100 times. But what happens here is that we cannot predict in this way when the insert ended to do the select all. What we are doing here is when you have time, insert something, and when you have time, count something. And this could happen that we maybe do one insertion and one selection, as in the beginning of this output, almost in the beginning of this output, when we have 12, and then, where is? 10 and then 12, so we more or less did an insertion and a selection, one insertion and a selection. And then we have 15. That means that we inserted four, uh, three numbers before getting the results of the next select after, the select everything. And then all the three select that were pending for this insertion were executed one after the other, so we get 16, 16, 16. So we executed independently the things 100 times, but without a match between the insertion and the selection, in random order, let's say. In an order that is not, not even random, is unpredictable for us. Because it depends from the library, depends from the database, because the database is doing an insertion, maybe it's waiting to the completion of the insertion before doing the select, and vice versa, if doing a select, maybe it's waiting before editing the table while the selection is, is underway. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a synchronous JavaScript, it's also the database that could have some constraint additional, additional constraint. And here we have the database on our computer, in this computer. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we have the database on a server somewhere in the world, we also have the internet in the, in the middle. Mm -hmm. So we can have latency of the communication, etc. that can add unpredictability to these results. Now is a little bit clearer why it happens. Yes. Also here, over there. Okay. Uh, all of these also in the slides. So if you if you wa want to have another reference, it's also in the slide with some pictures, but more or less. Uh, so let me see if if there are some pictures that are easier to. Oh, not this. Um, A picture. So the insert is happening, and then select, and then an insert, and so there is overlap and <coughs> random numbers. Mm? So how we can fix it again? Oh, this is tricky. But this is a good example. So there is another file. It's called uh, query sync uh, that show how to fix it with the information that we have now, that are the classical JavaScript, and now we are going to see a method to solve this that is the contemporary JavaScript and will allow us to, to solve this and make this more evident. Uh, but how we can solve it if we want just to use the same thing that we have said before? We have said before that we need to put one thing in the callback of the other one, right? So here, here it's quite, quite a mess, actually, because we should, it's not working, but we should put this all inside the callback of the run. But not enough. Because we also want to insert when we counted. Mm -hmm. So we have the dependency between the, the select all and the insert, but also between the next insert and the previous select, one, select all. Otherwise, we risk to insert twice. And so we will need to probably destroy this 
for loop and manually say run and in the callback of the run all and in the callback of all run and in the callback of that run all etc so something like okay putting this in the callback let me not do that but putting this in the callback and that putting this in the callback and then reputting these in the callback, et cetera, et cetera. So we are having, if we do this way, as we, we have said before, putting the callback of the element or the what we want to have a dependency on in the previous element, in the previous callback, we're going to have this long list of callbacks that move uh, on, on the right, hmm? that moves in this direction, and we have a callback, with inside a callback, with inside a callback, with inside a callback, etc. And this is the callback hell that is useful, that is known in JavaScript. Hmm? Because you have a, a lot of callbacks, one inside the other, inside the other, inside the others, and this takes the names of callback hell. Because you have too many callbacks. In one after inside another, and it's also difficult to, to say, okay, I need to, to change something in the third insert, and here you have maybe 100 inserts. So what we are going to change? We need to count how many inserts, so it's also easy to, to make mistakes as a developer. So this is again, uh, but this is the way in which we, with the information that we have, is the way to, to do. We we, we have, so here if you, were, if you are curious after, you can see the sync version. But if we, we just want to have a synchronous with uh, callbacks, we should do this. A callback inside a callback inside a callback, etc. And it's unmaintainable. This is crazy after a certain point. So to handle it and write this code. Or are we in the right callback? Yeah. How many uh, parentheses I have to close in the end? 10, 15, and in which parentheses are, in which line we are. Hmm? So this is, was a problem. Hmm? That, uh, get this name of callback hell. It's not a name that I, I invented. It's just the official name. Um, and, but let me put it back as it was. Okay. But it's, it's a way for the information that we have, it's a way to solve this. Mm? So here, there is again the picture of, of what we, we have said. Mm? So put the, the be all inside the insert and then the insert inside the be all, et cetera, creating this long chain of uh, callback inside a callback inside a callback. And a solution that it was added in ES 20, 2015 to solve this callback hell and to make uh, a synchronous but code more evident and clear is promises. Um, okay. We have said that. Nesting, callback hell, etc. So we have clear, right? Which is the problem? Yes, no. Wake up, yes. So uh, they added uh, a feature in the language that will avoid us to have a callback inside a callback inside a callback, etc. But yet keeping the code uh, asynchronous and also having a little bit more evidence of the callback. And they call it promise. Uh, because I it's, it's, it's a good name to me, a promise, because what you obtain using this from a callback, from a, an asynchronous function, is a promise. A promise that at a certain point in the future, that object will have some information attached. Mm? So you will have a fulfilled promise if you have all the data, or you have a rejected promise if you have an error. But promise is a very good name for this, because it gives you the idea that the function asynchronous will give you, will promise you that at a certain point, some data will arrive. Hmm? Uh, so this is, again, a possible solution to the callback hell. Among other things, it would also make code more, more clear. And 
and also it's a fundamental building for something that we are going to see immediately after that is another way to writing promises and asynchronous function with um, two keywords one is called async and the other is called await uh, that makes code mo much more clear and looks like synchronous so without having to, to remember that uh, so what is a promise a promise is an object it's a JavaScript object mm? representing again it's a promise the eventual completion or not of an operation that is asynchronous mm? so an asynchronous function will return an object of type promise that will promise the rest of the code that at a certain point that value will be something, field. But you have an object that will contain that information in the meantime. An object that is not yet resolved, but is still an object. Hmm? So instead of just, oh, I have a callback, this is a synchronous, let's proceed with the code. And if we have some results there, I need to put everything in the in the callback the callback can return an object of this type and the rest of the code will know that that object is either filled so there is the results or rejected if there is no result uh, available because there is an error or in a state waiting for the results to, to come and so JavaScript is able to handle this And well, clearly promises can be created or consumed. Uh, currently, most of the uh, API for the web in JavaScript give you a promise as a result. We return a promise. So you, you, you have to consume that promise, to use the promise in your, in your program. And again, when consumed, a promise starts in this pending state. That is, I'm waiting. I just I'm promising you that we'll give you data, but right now I don't have this data. So I'm waiting. Uh, and so the, the function will continue the execution, and then when the promise is fulfilled, then it will be ready and it can be consumed. And at that point, the function will either return the promise in a fulfilled state or in a rejected state. And so a promise has three states, pending, fulfilled, that is completed with success, or reject error and, and you want the fulfilled state in the end Poss possibly so how we can create a promise hmm? so a promise is created with a new keyword so we can create a variable and say new promise and the promise wants a callback that has two parameters the first one indicates uh, resolve and the second ones indicate reject and they are typically used in this way mm, because they can be used in the code as function mm. so you define a new promise resolve or reject and here handle you handle what happens when the promise is fulfilled or not so when the promise is fulfilled you return the value that is fulfilled and you do this returning through the resolve, where is the resolve uh, function, and instead, if you want to reject the promise, you write reject and the reason for the failure, so the error. Hmm? So typically, e the reject is either a string on an error, an object containing an error. Hmm? So in the case of our uh, database, uh, for instance, the resolve uh, of the courses. Uh, the resolve will be the results array with all the courses and the reject will be the error stemming from uh, SQLite, if any. So this is how you create a promise. Uh, and you well, can clear, clearly uh, create a function that returns a promise in this way. So you can create a promise as an object and then also you can return clearly a promise in a in a, in a function so for instance here you have a function that's called wait for a duration 
that will return a promise and if the duration in is minor than zero wait minus five seconds it's not possible to wait for a negative time until now mm -hmm. then you reject with an error like time travel not available uh, otherwise you create a timeout you set a timeout for the duration that is positive and when the timeout is triggered you will just resolve the await function so the set timeout will do what is written here in the callback so here you just say return back after the wait and continue with the execution there is no value to print just a value say go on because two seconds more or less are passed or whatever is the duration And this is for creating, uh, let me see this one moment, okay. Uh, this is for creating, instead if you want to consume a promise, that is something that is, uh, that typically you, you have to do when you create a promise, but also when other libraries give you a promise. Uh, when a promise is fulfilled, you have to use the dot then function to consume the promise. And this will tell JavaScript to wait until the promise is fulfilled. Mm. So we have this wait function here, mm. similar to one before. And what we are saying is that call the function. When the promise is fulfilled, print the result. That wait will, will give you a result, probably. Otherwise, dot catch. And this is chained function dot then dot catch. It's the catch that is appended to the then. Uh, you can also have only dot then, only dot catch. Often you have only dot, dot then because maybe you don't, in the, in the first run, you are not interested in catching errors. But you should have both in, in any order. And dot catch instead. It's called when the promise is rejected. Hmm? So dot then, when the promise is fulfilled, dot catch, error, when the promise is rejected. And if nothing waiting on wait promise when the promise is in the pending state. Hmm? Uh, and these are, then a catch are instance method defined on a promise. Hmm? So if you have a promise, something that returns a promise, either a promise that you create as an object or a function returning a promise, you can always call dot then and dot catch. Mm? And dot then and dot catch will give you the results returned from a promise uh, if there is any result. So you can also call dot then without any uh, variable, any parameter. parameter. And because if you, don't, if you just return a resolve promise without a value, mm? but just the information that that operation, that a synchronous operation is completed, then you can manipulate, you, you know the information, you have the trigger uh, for you, and you can do other things. Hmm? Uh, so why they can be um, chained then and catch? Because they return promises. So when you say function that return promise dot then, dot that then will return a promise. And also dot catch will return a promise. So you, you can change that because all of them will return a promise. And so it w they work. And uh, then there is also a finally, if you want, then when the promise is fulfilled, catch when there is an error, so it's not fulfilled, it's rejected. And finally, it's a, like try catch and finally, and finally is executed in any case. It's something that no matter whether the promise is rejected or not, it will be executed. So as soon as the promise returns something, uh, fulfilled or not, it will be executed also finally. Hmm? Uh, and it's typically use, useful for avoid duplication. If you want to, say, to do the same thing in then and in catch, instead of duplicating code, you can have the same code in finally. And here there is, uh, again, a uh, graphics. Uh, 
uh, a graph that show you graph a picture that show you that you see here you resolve something and that something is the one that is returned when you consume the promise and if you reject with an object that object is the one that is provided to the catch in the uh, in the consumption of the promise and then here there is a uh, fake example actually because it's not really complete uh, that show you that mm, since then and catch both return promise they can be uh, cho chained mm, but not only a then and catch you can also chain a promise with another promise mm. so if you imagine that get issue get over and send email will all get a promise you can write dot then mm. so get issue will return a promise so this then will wait for the promise of a get issue. Get owner will get a promise. So this then will wait for the promise of the get, the, the get owner before executing the send email. And then this will execute everything else. So we are here, when we call this get repo info, we are waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. So like writing in the callbacks, copying and paste code in the callbacks, but here we are going it with this dot then. Mm? And the function ends and returns something. Mm? So get repo info will, uh, for instance, get information from, I don't know, GitHub or GitLab. And then when it's done, it will return a promise. And the results of the promise will be used to get the issues on that specific repository. And then when the issues will be get from GitLab, GitHub, whatever, the promise will be solved, fulfilled, and now you have the issue from the repository in this variable. And this variable will be used to get the owner from the issue, calling the API of git something. And that owner, as soon as the promise is fulfilled, it will give you owner here, the the object containing the owner, and so you can call another method that is send email that will use the email address of the owner to send the actual email. And again, the email address of the owner is given by this that is asynchronous, and the issue is given by the get issues that is asynchronous, and the repo is get from the get repo info that is asynchronous. So all of these are synchronous function, and the then will allow you to wait until it's executed the code and clearly if you have here other code this other code will will run in a synchronous way mm? will not wait for but if you have to wait mm? you can use this then that is way better than having a callback that having the get issue inside the get the callback of the get repo info and the get owner inside this callback and the send email inside this callback mm? like before this is in the main program. You can have these five lines and you see all, all the chain of promises of, of a synchronous function. And you see also that these are all a synchronous function because you have this then and you will return a promise. And you, it's, it's important, it was written here, it's important to always return, some, return something always return a resolve, even if it's an empty result. Otherwise, this then will not work. So if you have an object to return, better. If you just have to, an information that is fulfilled, at least return uh, result, resolve like where? Like here. Here, it just return resolve as a function, in a way, through the set them out. Uh, okay, here there is another example of chaining uh, with this fetch me method that is a fetch that is a method for getting information from a, from a URL. Uh, that is the default method. It's not something that we have to implement, and it will give you a a, a promise as a result. And finally, before the break, uh, 
we can create promises, but if we want, we can also, uh, we have also these two methods to execute several asynchronous operation in parallel. So not just one uh, asynchronous operation that waits for the previous one, that waits for the previous one, etc., but they are waiting in order. So the third one is waiting for the second one, and it's waiting for the first one, etc. Uh, here, if we want to execute things in parallel, we have three asynchronous operations to, to run in the same moment, hmm? uh, to start at least in the same moment, together in parallel. And promise as an object will give you other two methods. One is called all, and we'll accept here as a parameter an array of promises, of promises objects, and the, the race is, is another method. What's the difference? Promise all takes an array of promises as an input, returns the promises, and execute all the promises together. Mm? Start all the promises together. Mm? Uh, all will reject, will give you reject if at least one of the promises passed as an input are rejected. So all of these should be fulfilled to have a fulfilled promise. Otherwise, even if one of them is rejected, all is rejected. So the all, the promise from all is rejected. And if they are all fulfilled, the promise returning from this will be an array of the value coming out from the resolve of the single, of the single promises hmm? in order. And the input array for all can also contain non-promises, like five, uh, so variables, numbers, strings, whatever. In that case, they will be immediately resolved because you don't have to wait to, to know that a string is a string. A string is always is immediately a string. You don't have to wait for any operation. Mm? So in this promises that all you can also run in parallel different things if you want to wait that all of them will be available at the same time. And if you have something that is not a promise, you can also insert them if you need to have all of them at a certain point in time. Back. Uh, race works in a very similar way, but the difference is that returns a promise a single promise that is fulfilled or rejected when the first or the promise in the array is fulfilled or rejected, first in time is fulfilled or rejected. So all wait for all, race wait for the fastest, let's say, to return. And as soon as the first one return, either reject or fulfilled, it will be returned. So it's a race condition. It's, it's a race, it's actually a race. The fastest will, be get, will, ge, will, will get returned, the lowest, the, the slowest will not. Okay, we, we are going to see an example on promises after the break and after a sync await uh, with database, etc. So we can also create the pro new promises, return promises, etc. So it should be uh, easier to also get that. Any question up to now? Nope. Okay, let's do 15 minutes of break. And let's restart at 10 or 5.